a year and a half ago, um, then in that chain, there will be about one new mutation every couple of weeks. And the average kind of uh, intergenerational time in that infection chain is, it's not exactly clear, but it's probably something like five or six days. So probably every other or every third time there's an infection, uh, there's a mutation that goes along with it. And so what that means is, if anyone's ever thought about or has worked on, on viral uh, genetics or phylogenies, is that you can certainly use that, and that diversity is happening in every transmission chain. So of course, there's tons of diversification happening because sadly, this virus has infected so many people around the world. So you can use that information to try to watch how the virus transmits, but it's also not totally straightforward to use it, for example, you know, to build a very detailed transmission map of every single infection because there's, there's often not enough variation at that very fine scale. Um, and in fact, you know, the use of, of genomes in infectious disease has been used before and um, sort of demonstrated to have a variety of, of use cases. And one that's probably the most widespread, which I'm not going to talk very much about, is um, a group of sort of targeted use cases where what you want to do is look at a specific outbreak, say, for example, this is a figure from a paper that came from some colleagues of uh, an outbreak in um, a hospital in Cambridge in the first wave of the of the um, COVID-19 pandemic last spring. And the question there is, um, if you have a bunch of infections within a healthcare setting, is it one introduction to say a healthcare worker that then spread um, to many other individuals in that setting, or are they multiple community transmissions that are then imported into the, into the hospital? And um, there have been a number of uses of this kind. Um, they, for example, this, uh, this paper also looked at um, some uh, kidney dialysis units where that population of individuals is very highly susceptible uh, to severe outcomes from COVID. And uh, they were trying to understand, for example, how a number of individuals were getting infected in the, in the spring wave. And it turned out to be not actually about the dialysis unit itself, but about the um, transport of patients. Sometimes they would carpool or there would be, you know, a, a sort of bus would be sent out to collect a whole bunch of patients and that exposed them to infection. And so they made some changes to that kind of thing um, in subsequent dialysis appointments so they could reduce that kind of exposure. And I just wanna call out now that um, the work that I'm gonna be describing that Sanger has done is part of a bigger initiative called the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium or COG UK. This group is a collaboration of a couple of hundred people, virologists, sequence experts, public health experts, um, uh, et cetera, who were brought together by Sharon Peacock and others in March of last year, so very early on in the pandemic, to say, can we across the UK come up with a um, collaborative effort to use genomics uh, to fight this pandemic? And I think it's a testament to Sharon's leadership and the others early on in that, in that meeting, as well as to um, some of the UK government funders that they got behind this effort very, very early on, which meant the UK was able to build a kind of infrastructure to do genome sequencing as I'll, I'll allude to in a few minutes at a scale that is much bigger than most other places in the world. Um, and many of the groups within COG UK, so Sanger is the biggest single sequencing center. We've done about half of the total genome sequencing of the consortium. Many of the other groups, for example, work closely with the local hospital and do the kinds of things uh, that I was just talking about, investing outbreaks, as well as work on the sort of these sort of um, broader national questions that I'm going to talk about in, in this presentation. And that broader national stuff is um, what's now um, sort of widely described as genomic surveillance, which is basically to take a random sample of all of the people who test positive in a, in a location, uh, in this case, the United Kingdom, uh, where you have a high case burden, sequence their genomes and share that information to basically use it to track uh, the spread of the virus. So what do we do at the Sanger Institute? Well, the UK was pretty, uniquely positioned to do this genomic surveillance of COVID at scale um, for a couple of reasons. The first is COG UK, which as I mentioned, was put together very early on and had a lot of the critical pieces. The second is uh, a lot of the community testing, which is so-called pillar two in the UK, uh, is centralized at a small number of testing sites. So about six or seven around the country. Um, and these are basically, if you go to a car park to get a swab or order a home test kit, 
um, that kind of thing, that they all get sort of uh, rapidly sent to one of these handful of locations, uh, tested, and the result is reported back. This is the kind of thing that if I give this talk to people in the UK or the US, everyone is accustomed to constantly getting uh, COVID tests, which maybe you guys are uh, gratefully much less uh, accustomed to. Um, so, the, so this is different than what has been done in some other countries. There are some criticisms about centralizing tests, but one thing it does give, uh, and I think actually the testing part of the UK's response has been very good if the more difficult tracing and isolation has been less successful. But one thing that centralized testing means is that you can then bolt on additional um, work afterwards. And in, in our case, that's sequencing the waste material of these PCR tests. So basically every day, these chilled vans drive from these test centers all over the country, um, or in the case of uh, the one in Northern Ireland, they get put on a ferry, which uh, kind of amusingly was delayed when Brexit happened because the samples had to cross the uh, Irish Sea. Um, the, but the, these green boxes that are full of, um, of the essentially the waste material from PCR tests are shipped down to the Sanger. They're unloaded from these vans. We early on in the pandemic stood up these sort of back of a lorry sized um, temporary freezers uh, at minus 20 and we offload uh, these samples into those freezers. We have enough space for something like 7 million samples. And at this point, there's actually a mix of positive and negative PCR tests. Um, and that ratio of course fluctuates massively over the course of the epidemic. When it's um, low, there's mostly negative tests here. And when it's high, unfortunately there's lots of positive tests. So then the next step after that is to unpack these crates and they are basically full of 96 well plates that come straight off the back of the PCR testing lines, uh, sort those out and then put them on. We, we repurposed essentially a couple of the big labs at Sanger uh, to a combined manual robotic cherry picking uh, line. So essentially what we need to do here is select out just those uh, RNA samples that are positive for COVID so they have some of the viral RNA in them uh, and consolidate those down into plates that we can then push on to our high throughput sequencing pipeline. So in this case, we've, um, for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, we've uh, used pretty much across all of the COG UK partners, a, uh, the so-called Arctic Amplicon PCR approach that basically has a set of 90 something PCR pairs that tile with some overlap across the viral genome. So the library prep involves amplifying those up um, because you have relatively small amounts of material in the starting um, sample. And then we sequence them on Illumina NovaSeqs. Lots of others use uh, Oxford Nanopore technology. There's a little bit of uh, PAC bio sequencing. They all generate pretty high quality, consistent data. And in fact, when we do the analysis, we, we mix the, um, the data from the different sequencing platforms. And um, the scale at which we've done this uh, has grown and grown, we kind of, Sanger set up this relationship with the so-called Lighthouse Labs, these big centralized PCR testing facilities in the summer of 2020, and you know, kind of got to sequencing a thousand of these a week, and then a couple of thousand, and then five or 6,000 a week by the end of last year, 10,000 in January of this year, and now uh, we're routinely able to process 20,000 sequences uh, every week. Um, and in fact, at the moment, because of the lockdown that the UK has been in, um, for the last several months. That means that of, of the Lighthouse Labs, the centralized facilities we work with, of all the samples they can send us every week, uh, we, we only try to sequence those with a cycle threshold or CT value bigger than 30. So that's basically, a, uh, sorry, less than 30. That's basically a way of measuring the strength of the PCR test uh, for the presence of the virus and higher numbers means less virus. And basically what we found is that above a value of 30, basically the, the ability to get a good sequence just falls off. Uh, so if we take only those set which have CT less than 30 and which come from the labs we have, we can now basically process and, and sequence all of them. Um, and that really gives us an incredibly detailed picture of how the virus is transmitting in the UK. And if you sort of add that up over the course of the pandemic, uh, Sanger has sequenced something now like 260,000 genomes uh, the whole COG UK consortium has done just shy, I think, of, or maybe just past 400,000. Um, and that's of a sort of total, if you look at Gizade, the kind of global database of these things, the total global output is, I don't know, eight or 900,000 now. So the UK is a huge contributor to that total amount. So the question is, what can you do with all of that data? And I'm going to tell you about what we were planning to do uh, and still probably plan to do 
um, but we were really looking at this in, in the fall of last year. And I'll show you a couple of pictures that look like this. Um, and this is, first of all, the lines on this plot are over, this is 2020. The light gray line is um, the kind of number of positive tests we were getting from around the whole UK on an arbitrary y-axis. So you can see in the spring, um, there was you know a kind of peak, but of course, as we know, both in the UK and globally, there was not nearly enough testing. So the absolute value of this is, is pretty meaningless because there were lots and lots of untested positive cases. Then in the UK, there was a relatively quiet period of the epidemic in the summer um, after the first lockdown really suppressed the virus and probably for some amount of, um, there's some amount of seasonality. So there was a relatively quiet period. And then unfortunately, beginning in the fall up to when this graph goes, uh, the case numbers really took off again. In, that, in the heavy black line is specifically uh, the city of York in the north of England. Um, and uh, you can see that it generally followed the same pattern. So it's a sort of subset. It had a peak in the spring, quiet summer, and then went up again in the fall. And the weeks, this is week by week, and the weeks with a dot are those where we had a sufficient number of genomes so that the line is just this, that flow of samples in the trucks. And then the dots are, and we had a sufficient number of genomes to do a statistical test of essentially the, the amount of variability in that place in that week. So what you can imagine is in York, in the beginning of, or the middle of June, let's say this dot, um, if I just set, pull genomes out of the bag at random, what's the chance that I'm going to pull two that are close to identical? So we allow a sort of one or two SNP difference. And the idea there is to try to differentiate um, kind of diffuse community transmission where you have, you know, lots of different small transmission chains of one person infecting one or two others versus so-called super spreader events where one person or one context might lead to 10 or 20 or, you know, in some rare cases, 50 uh, infections. And we know this is important about the transmission patterns of this virus because um, the, you know, the famous R number of the average number of, uh, of onward transmissions of each new infection is highly over dispersed. So lots of people never infect anyone else. Then there's a lot that have, you know, in fact, one person, but then you have this long tail of, of super spreading events. And basically what the data look like if you peek under this is, uh, this is just a way of representing the barcodes. These are, these strings are, of letters and numbers are basically a way of pinpointing that sequence on the local tree. But the way you can read them is, you know, if they are very similar, you know, the, the sort of bits by dots actually correspond to traversing the, the nodes of the tree down to almost the, the sort of terminal leaf for each sequence. But you can basically think of them as barcodes. And if they look similar, they have similar sequences. And if they are identical, they have identical sequences, plus or minus one or two personal mutations for each sequence. Um, one other thing to notice on this is you can see that the, the data were sparse as we were trying to figure things out and get us scaled up. But by basically the late summer, we got to the point where, you know, in this particular example, we had a good amount of data to make an estimate every week. Um, and um, that was true sort of nationwide. So it was basically we were scaled up and running by the, by the autumn. So here's a very different looking picture. Swindon, which is a town in the south of England, they had a peak in the, in the uh, spring, but then they began to have a quiet summer, but had a really sharp peak in the late summer. And this actually made the news because, uh, you know, elsewhere in, in England, there wasn't much going on. Uh, in the epidemic in the summer, but it was things were getting really bad in Swindon. And you can see that here the sequence uh, are colored red and the red's basically an empirical test of that um, homozygosity statistic I just described where you're asking are these things are these things identical and it's simply asking is it further out, how far out is it in the sort of empirical distribution of all location weeks uh, in our total distribution and if it's uh, above some threshold we can sort of light up a red light. And if you peek at the data, you can just see it has a very different looking pattern where of the whatever this is, 11 or so sequences we generated in uh, the second week of July in Swindon, almost all of them were exactly the same. And we know if you, we kind of knew this going in, that this was the signal we were looking for because uh, there was a publicized outbreak in a, in a logistics facility for the Iceland grocery store chain so that they sell frozen food basically. And this is a indoor workplace that's kept at a very low temperature and probably involves people kind of having to shout back and forth as they uh, do their jobs. It's, you know, another equivalent workplaces um, like meatpacking uh, facilities, for example. And these have been the, the site of a number of outbreaks worldwide um, of this virus. 
and the timeline, which is just from the sort of Swindon Borough Council website, was that in late July, a public statement was made about an outbreak that happened. They kept that workplace and others open. A week later, they kind of sent a swabbing van to park outside this facility and tested everybody who worked there. Uh, about a week later, they designated all of Swindon an area of concern. At this point in the summer, there was this kind of elevation of, of how they did public health action in response to local outbreaks. And by late, uh, by sorry, middle of August, the facility outbreak was totally com com contained, but because they hadn't contained it within the initial outbreak and it had spread to the whole community, they had to do a whole borough-wide campaign to deal with the aftermath and, and sort of reduce uh, the effect. But of course, what was really happening was before any of this became apparent, there was some kind of super spreading condition. Someone or some small number of people were at the facility and basically the spread was happening very rapidly. And it was because there was a delay in understanding what was going on that public health action could be taken that meant this, this particular situation got sort of out of control. And this isn't really a criticism of, of the public health agencies because these are hard things to grapple with. They get out of hand uh, if you have a bit of bad luck very quickly. The point that, I, that we noticed is that, you know, the first week um, where the genome data was, you know, showing a signal of concern was before the first time when, when they really had acted. So our hypothesis was if you could generate the genomic data fast enough, and that is a big if, because at this point there was like a three week delay between the day of sampling and the day when the data was available for analysis. So we were really working hard to bring that turnaround time as low as possible. But if you could get it early enough, then it could be one of many factors you could put in alongside transmission rates, um, you know, other kinds of uh, things you can measure. Like for example, there's an app in the UK that people can register if they have symptoms and you could try to, and there's also a contact tracing app, which has had varying degrees of success, but it could be one thing that if for, for these kinds of things in a, in a world where you have relatively low transmission, you're trying to stomp out every outbreak, that if you bring your action forward by a, even a few days, that might um, help you overall keep things under better control. And we, you know, we knew that Swindon story was in the data when we went, uh, when we started. So, you know, we went and just looked, okay, if I just look at the other significant um, uh, data points, what do we see? And so, for example, here's a picture of Durham, which looks again, a lot more like the national uh, picture. In fact, there were two significant signals of um, super spreading in Durham in early August. And if I just Googled Durham outbreak August, in fact, you find exactly uh, there was one that in this case you can see was caught very effectively because it didn't cause a massive community increase in cases. It was traced to this particular somewhat drab looking pub where essentially uh, there was over a couple of days, a huge number of cases traced directly back to this. And again, in that case, the public health agencies were able to kind of contain that relatively quickly. But it, it did give us, again, some confidence that a, an instance we didn't know was there shows up in the genome data in, in a kind of hypothesis free way. So we built a little set of scripts to try to, again, process the data as quickly as possible. By late November last year, we were about two weeks behind the kind of when the swab was in someone's nose date. So still probably too slow for public health action, but getting better. And we could make this picture every week of um, locations around England. Uh, in this case, this is the week up to the end of November. Um, the underlying work was built by a postdoc in the team, uh, Matt Sinnott. And we had been seeing for a little while, um, really for several weeks, uh, a so basically th this map is sort of amber if you have uh, somewhat elevated levels of homozygosity and red if you have if you're right out in the tail of the distribution. And we had seen that in the southeast of England, specifically in this place, Medway uh, in Kent, and also by this point in a couple of other um, authorities in Kent, uh, a very high rate of um, identical genomes, basically. And we didn't quite know what to make of this. We were kind of, you know, this was in the beta testing phase and we didn't exactly know how to process these data. Uh, if you read the excellent news source, Kent Online, News You Can Trust, which I'm sure all of you read regularly, again, you know, by just kind of the Google validation approach, we were trying to figure out what was going on. And there had been actually a massive outbreak in a prison on the Isle of Sheppey, um, which is right there in that, in that, um, in Medway in Kent. And so we thought, oh, well, maybe what, what we've discovered here is, again, a slightly lagged signal of an outbreak um, within this prison. But again, we didn't really know what to, what to sort of do with that information at that point. It turns out that, that other groups, uh, other collaborators in COG UK, as well as in Public Health England, were really looking at exactly the same part of the country uh, at the same time. 
So this is a map now, nothing to do with genomes, but of just the, the case rate, the number of cases um, in places around the UK. And basically, uh, green is not very much. So Scotland was doing reasonably well in Wales, North Wales, certainly. Um, blue is a bit more and purple is, is the worst. And so there was like a bit of an outbreak in the south of Wales. Um, but then also there had been a um, really steep increase of rate of cases overall in exactly the same place in Medway. And this is the Isle of Sheppey up here. It's at the mouth of the Thames River. Um, and this was especially worrying because uh, November was actually a kind of lockdown light for the UK. So those previous pictures I was showing you, they only went up until the early autumn. Um, and basically cases were going up and the country introduced a national lockdown, but it wasn't as strict as the spring ones. Schools were open, for example, people were encouraged to go to work. There were various, you know, kind of exceptions that um, tried to not completely constrain uh, economic activity, but they meant that, and it did actually work in most parts of the country, case numbers were coming down, except for this stubborn bit in the Southeast. And in fact, if you fast forward an, a week further, so this is the very end of the lockdown as it's just being lifted, there was this concern because things were shooting up in, by this point, all of Kent and indeed in the east of London as well. And the question, the question here really became, this can happen that you see one version of the genome um, in a place where cases are going up and you don't know what's cause and effect. Because basically, let's just hypothesize for a moment that something else was happening. People weren't complying with the lockdown in this region. Case numbers will go up and maybe there is just essentially, um, it's, it's a bit of uh, luck that one one variant of the virus happens to be the one that kind of hitchhikes on the increasing case numbers to be at a high frequency. So what you really need is, is, is a, and this is the, the kind of problem of genomic epidemiology in real time. So you need a statistical model and the, the easiest way to do this is to basically watch as the new variant of the virus arrives in new locations sort of over time. And it shouldn't be the case that as it arises in new cases, it will increase in frequency compared to whatever is already circulating there if it doesn't have any inherent advantage. Whereas if a new variant is inherently more transmissible, it grows faster, then as it arrives in a new place, it will go on the same trajectory to increase in frequency. And so we, together with um, Harold Veringer and Moritz Gerstung at the EBI, uh, built a, that we, we were just beginning by sort of fortunate coincidence, a, a collaboration to build a model that linked our genome data to the public number of cases data to essentially estimate um, over time the proportion of different variants of the virus uh, sort of location by location. So here's Swale, which is um, one level of the, the sort of hierarchy of local authorities in England where that uh, place Medway uh, is in Kent. And this is the proportion of, uh, of three different variants of the virus over time in that place. So uh, red is um, the so-called B.1.177, somewhat confusingly, that's not the, the famous UK variant, but has all the similar numbers, uh, numbers in it, which had been spreading around the UK and indeed a lot of Europe since the summer. Um, and it's, it's sort of, this one is kind of an interesting case of what I was just saying. It was traced back to Spain and seemed to have been brought back by holiday makers because there was a lot of travel allowed last summer in Europe uh, to lots of countries in Europe, and then it grew. And there's, a, there's not complete consensus. It seems like it was likely this variant was perhaps a bit more biologically fit, but really it also got very lucky that it just sort of seeded itself in many places where there wasn't an, a large amount of ongoing transmission. And so it grew. And so it was the most common thing in sort of the early autumn. Blue here is all other variants of the virus. So there's just a bunch of diversity of other stuff going on. And then green is B117, the, the so-called UK or Kent variant. Um, and what you can see is that in Swale, it started sort of in September, October, and it rapidly grew to displace essentially all other uh, variants of the virus. And so by the end of uh, November here, it had been almost, it was almost every infection in this place was B117. And the question is, statistically, is that chance or cause? And what we did was build this model, as I said, which now just sort of layered this onto every location throughout England. Here's Stevenage, which is a, um, a, a, a small town in um, sort of just south of Cambridge, basically in England. Um, the, what you can see is that by the by this same point in late November, B117 had arrived and was growing, 
but hadn't yet grown. But actually, as we accumulated data up to the present day, it absolutely exploded. Similarly, here's Staffordshire Moorlands. I'm testing everyone's uh, English geography knowledge. This is um, near Stoke and uh, the, um, the uh, Peak District National Park, which is a nice place to visit. Also, the Alton Towers um, uh, theme park is in this part of England. It's, it's further north is the short version of all of that. And what you can see is that B117 had just barely arrived here by late November, but again, at, once they've got a foothold, it spread and has, like everywhere else, taken over to be essentially completely dominant. Um, there was also another group uh, that we were working with. Eric Voltz from Imperial led this uh, together with colleagues, including Nick Lohman, Andy Rambo, uh, Mira Chand at Public Health England. There was a really great kind of community of, of scientists who were all looking at these same things and comparing notes and trying to feed this information as as quickly as we could into the decision-making bodies because it seemed like there was a serious problem on our hands. And what Harold and, and Moritz did was actually the next step of this was, okay, so we believe that this variant is more transmissible. You can use the same model to, in, to estimate locally the R number that I mentioned earlier. So the number of onward transmissions on average uh, per new infection. And basically if that number is greater than one, then the epidemic is growing and you are in trouble exponentially. And if the number is less than one, the, the epidemic is shrinking exponentially. And there's a kind of interesting thing that it's very hard, countries have tried to do this, but to have to maintain policies that keep you at exactly R of one, i.e. you have a sort of sustainable ongoing epidemic, um, because basically a, a little bit above or a little bit of below tips you into an exponentially changing uh, pattern. And that's why all of these, you know, epidemiological curves are constantly kind of big swings up and then down again because you're you know you're always fighting to um to if you if that's what your goal is to keep things on a sort of steady keel so this is the end of november and we can estimate the this r value for other non-b117 lineages and what you can see is that there was maybe some slight pass sorry in this case red is r greater than one blue is less than one and white is exactly in the middle and you can see that in most parts of england um the lockdown light was working, things were not so great in, in London, but generally speaking, it was a sort of uh, sensible policy. But the unfortunate thing is that B117, basically everywhere, even under the conditions of that light lockdown, was still growing and had R greater than one. And this is a sort of, the model is slightly projecting to places where at this point, there were very few observations, but wherever there were observations of this sequence, it was consistent that this set of restrictions was insufficient. And this was really the problem was that the government policy was to open up in December to, to allow a lot of um, inter-individual and inter-household mixing over Christmas. And what this meant was that, unfortunately, B117 was seeding itself all over the country over the course of late November. And if you sort of fast forward to mid-December, there was likely going to be some kind of a problem, which maybe policymakers had baked in that you know, in this is the middle of December, things were going to grow regardless. But really, the, the, the unexpected disaster was that B117 was by this point in most places in England and grew very quickly in uh, December and caused the massive spike in cases uh, in late December and January and led to uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, having to give this um, very glum looking press conference uh, where he more or less canceled Christmas. It was amazing. I mean, he, you know, I don't envy decision makers. And it was amazing, actually, to me that, you know, we were putting together sort of the jigsaw pieces of, of this puzzle. And I'll, I'll talk about another couple of them in a minute, about how serious B117 really is. It causes a new epidemic on top of the epidemic, because it's something like 60 or 70% more transmissible. And that network of scientists that I was talking about, kind of managed to, to in a matter of weeks, make a pretty strong case that things needed to change and fed that to the, you know, the groups, the scientific groups that collate evidence and, and advise the UK government. And the UK government did make changes that were not at all popular uh, very rapidly. And I remember, you know, people, my sort of friends on Twitter watching this, thinking that um, the prime minister had kind of made up this variant story as a convenient uh, excuse for having to, to do a policy change. But actually I think, you know, they, reacted to scientific evidence that changed very quickly in, a, in an admirably short amount of time. The good news was, unfortunately, it wasn't fast enough to prevent the big spike that the UK had to deal with. The, the good news was that the, which we didn't know on you know, January 1st, was that 
the strict lockdown the UK did impose is sufficient to control B117. As you can see that other lineages in strict lockdown, this is late January, you know, dark blue everywhere was clearly uh, strongly suppressing the other lineages. B117 is paler blue, but still blue on average consistently. And that's very good news because it, you know, it would have been an extremely grim situation for humanity if, a vi if the virus had mutated to a situation where it could evade even very strict lockdown. Um, if you sort of put these pieces together, here's a, an animation of the spread of B117 as a proportion. Yellow is not at all to black as everything over time from the fall. And you could just see it seeded itself, spread throughout the Southeast. Another, some, someone traveled to the Northwest. And so another wave started up there. Uh, and then by the end of the kind of current wave, you can just see that as of today, you know, when I looked at yesterday's data, like 99.8% of new infections of coronavirus are B117. So it just, uh, and what's the, the, as I said, the lockdown is controlling it. So the numbers are coming down slowly um, of B117, but much more slowly than other things. We've almost completely pushed to extinction all the other lineages uh, of the virus in the UK. Sorry, I mean. Head. We hoped, uh, you know, it was, we were fast, as fast as almost any country probably could have been in finding this in the UK last year, but still it had spread too far to prevent that grim animation I just showed you. We kind of hoped that the warning might be sufficient in other countries. And I want to call out Denmark as uh, another country that has done a truly amazing amount of um, sequencing in terms of total proportion of cases sequenced, they are almost at the top of the league table. I think actually Australia is higher, but of course you guys have it easier because the total number of sequences that needs to be generated is rather smaller. Um, so Denmark uh, has sequenced, this is uh, the total genomes they've generated. Actually, if you look at the plot starting about here in kind of early, um, early 21, they're sequencing almost all of their cases. They, they stood up this capacity actually in response to uh, some of you may remember a story about Danish mink farms from last year in what seems like an almost different lifetime, which was the first kind of variant of concern that caused a lot of worry. Um, and thankfully, in that case, kind of petered out. It didn't seem to actually be particularly well adapted for rapid transmission in humans, but it it um, led the Danes to do a lot of sequencing. And the, the red proportion of these bars is the proportion of B117. And they really knew, um, you know, back in late 2020 that the UK variant so-called had made it into continental Europe. It was out of half a percent, then 1%, 2%, 4%, et cetera, et cetera. They put in place a kind of intermediate amount of restrictions. And what you can see is that if you look at the gray curve, which is everything else, those intermediate restrictions essentially crushed the epidemic of non-B117 to the point where they also have it almost extinct. But the red bars, in addition to growing in proportion, were growing in absolute value. So there was essentially a growing epidemic of B117 on top of a shrinking epidemic of everything else. Um, and this is unfortunately seems to be happening in country after country. If you look at the current spike in cases in Europe, it seems very likely that essentially what's happening is, you know, they've kept more or less their non-B117 epidemic under control, but B117 is growing. Um, I, I want to switch and talk for a couple of minutes about, um, I've, I've almost entirely ignored the fact that the genomes actually contain some biological information and just been using them as barcodes to track things. One of the other pieces of key pieces of evidence uh, that led to understanding that P117 was a problem was actually to look at the mutations themselves. And Andrew Rambo from Edinburgh um, was, I think, the first one to really draw attention to this. I told you very early on that this virus mutates pretty slowly. And so if you draw a tree, if this is a, a tree of some of the earliest B117 sequences, and if you look at this bottom bit, these are all in the B117 lineage, and you can see the tree is very kind of tight and bushy, and there's not much, there's you know, lots of very closely related sequences. And that's what you usually look like if you pick any random branch of this tree over the past year of the pandemic. But the thing that's a bit weird in this is, these are some closely related B117, sorry, non-B117 sequences. So the other things in the tree, where there's this super long branch that separates this lineage from its neighbors in the tree. And that is very unusual because we sequence so much in the UK and because the mutation rate is relatively slow, we usually see sort of one by one or two by two, the mu new mutations arising. 
And this thing popped onto the scene in the UK with 20 um, mutations separating it from its nearest observed common ancestor, of which I think 17 are, um, are non-synonymous amino acid changing substitutions or deletions. And that is very weird. We have not seen that before. This can really be only one of two things, a sort of unusual burst of, uh, of evolution or um, an import from some other place in the world that isn't sequencing. And so it sort of, it has slowly been accumulating mutations um, over time in some place where there isn't any genome sequencing and then someone flew to the UK and kind of, that's why it looks so different from what we see. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute why I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's the former, that an unusual uh, period of mutation. But before I do that, I wanna call out just one particular mutation in the spike protein. So this is the uh, one of the viruses proteins that's the most important for the human virus immune interaction. So it's the key protein to bind to the ACE2 human protein that it uses to bind and invade cells. And this deletes two amino acids, 69 and 70, uh, from that protein. And just by complete coincidence, um, that mutation is in a part of the genome that is that is the target of some of the most widely used PCR tests for the virus. So basically, uh, the most widely used, certainly in the UK, and it's used a lot globally, uh, Thermo Fisher TACPATH assay uh, has three PCR targets that it amplifies, one in the S gene, one in the N nucleocapsid protein, and one in the um, non-structural uh, ORF1AB protein. And um, essentially, they just try to amplify these three bits of uh, sequence, and they look for essentially a you know presence absence, so a sort of green light, red light in each of these. And usually, if you have any virus, um, you see green, 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 all three channels light up. Um, and they the reason they do three is to have some redundancy, and redundancy for either assay failure or, as I'll describe in a second, if the virus mutates and those mutations make one of the channels uh, ineffective at detecting that that variant of the virus. And so one of the labs that had been testing using this facility basically showed uh, a massive increase. They kind of, you know, phoned us up in sort of um, uh, mid-November when the, this number was sort of 10 or 15% of what they call S dropout or S gene target failure, it's sometimes called. So this is the S is the spike gene. And basically what they were seeing was instead of green, green, green for positive tests, they were seeing red, green, green. So no signal in one of the three channels, but strong unambiguous signal in the other two. And they said, can you look and see, uh, is this explained by a mutation? And so this was all happening at the same kind of overlapping time as, as the story I've been telling you so far. And it became very clear that this mutation, deletion 6970, exactly explains this pattern. And that mutation has occurred recurrently through the history of this virus. And so, for example, there was another lineage which briefly got to about six or seven percent frequency in the UK in the summer and its sort of arisal and then disappearance almost exactly explains a minor bump that had been seen in this diagnostic so the so the black line is just all the tests failing and the dashed line is the sequenced subset we did in surveillance so we could say oh yeah that that frequency matches exactly so that explains that and the arrival of b117 clearly explained the increase in the massive increase that was happening in the latter part of 2020. And there are really two reasons why this became somewhat important in the story, which was, you can see this was, I made this graph at some point in December and the sequencing is, as I was alluding to before, lags by at this point by about two weeks from the kind of real time data. Whereas you get this S dropout value the day the test is done and also we were sequencing at that point, maybe like five or 10% of all positives for now up to like 50%, but we were only five or 10% then. Whereas this was like half of all tests in the UK. So you suddenly get much more real time and much more complete data. And so very quickly, uh, this S gene target failure was used to track the spread of, of B117 in the UK and could also be used to track the spread actually around the world. And um, in the United States, which, you know, kind of surprisingly, given its technological base has had very little sequencing, you know, it had, a, it had a lot in absolute numbers, but in terms of proportion of cases had very little sequencing um, last year, it's increased a lot now that it's become clear how important it is. But what you can do is use this S gene target failure data, which, which has been published. And unfortunately what can be seen is happening in the US is uh, 
there's a decreasing sort of similar pattern. The blue line is non S gene target failure, so kind of other lineages, and the red line is S gene target failure. So probably mostly B117. You can see in current hotspots, Michigan, for example, in Florida, there is a growth of um, B117 or in inferred B117. Uh, in some of those states. And so there's a very finely balanced situation, I think, because there's really a race between vaccination to impede B117, and I'll mention more about that in just a second, but, uh, and, and the growth of this variant as it kind of lands in various places and begins to spread. A um, couple of other things about the mutations. So there were a lot of them, as I mentioned, there were a lot specifically in spike, which is worrisome. And there were some in particular that were concerning in, in this case, most prominently, this N501Y uh, in the receptor binding domain, so that's really the you know, action site of the protein for binding to humans. Um, this was, uh, if you look, there's a clear uh, signal of positive selection in spike. So this is different from the history of the virus in humans for most of its, uh, its history, where basically it was well adapted to humans when it broke out, it kind of has to be. There's negative selection, um, purifying selection throughout the last 12 months, but then you get in this particular lineage, this burst of positive selection to create these new um, constellation of mutations. Um, if you look at one possibility is that some new mutational process is happening. Uh, we worked with some of our cancer colleagues, Inigo martin Carena at Sanger. The, these little bar graphs are basically looking at the, the kinds of mutations you have. So, for example, these red ones are C to T mutations, uh, and the different bars are the basically the base on either side. So, you know, going from an ACA to an ATA, for example, is this leftmost bar. Uh, cancer groups use these all the time to basically differentiate between there's mutational signatures, which are basically again a barcode of a different flavor across this picture for mutational damage from smoking or from a particular enzyme or from um, you know HPV or whatever. Uh, in this virus, almost all the mutations are these C to Ts. There's a kind of interesting question ongoing about a set of Apobec enzymes in humans, which degrade viral RNA, which probably cause a lot of these. Um, the, the main point in this picture is that the mutations that happened up until sort of October of 2020 and the mutations that have happened on the B117 background since it burst onto the scene have exactly the same picture. So fundamentally, something happened once to a first approximation that generated a whole bunch of new mutations that was different than the pattern, the process that was happening both before and afterwards. And what we think, there's no proof of this, but there's a pretty strong hypothesis that what that one process was is there are some individuals who are sick with this virus for a very long time, so called long-term shedders. So most people clear the virus in a couple of weeks. This isn't long COVID where you might have you've cleared the virus, but have persistent after effects. This is, you can't, your immune system can't quite kick the virus out. And what that creates is an environment in which um, the virus can evolve that's different than usually it gets two weeks in one host, it has to make a transmission to a new host, it gets two weeks there and so forth. Instead, what happens here is this is, this is one case report. There have been several different case reports uh, published and they all have a similar pattern where this is just a bunch of random sequences these are the branches of sequences taken serially over time, over a period of months from the same person. And you can see the evolution of the virus shoots out again, creates a long branch with a lot of mutations, a lot of mutations in spike, and indeed some of exactly the same mutations. So the N501Y that I mentioned to you, um, there's also briefly this uh, E484K, which is a pretty famous one now. There's some of the deletions that are very, very similar, not exactly the same, but similar to the 6971. So there's clear evidence in numerous case reports of convergent evolution, which usually doesn't go anywhere because sadly, often these patients die, they're, they're very ill after the end of their long infection. But occasionally it seems likely that they do escape. And in fact, as has now been the case, there are multiple instances where a new constellation of mutations evolves probably in one patient, makes the jump out to the population. And if it's very fit, as B117 clearly is, you can see in this kind of, uh, this is from next strain, uh, you know, a, a circular um, dendogram of the, of the a subselection of viruses around the world. You see these long branches, B117 jumps out into the action. There have now also been B1351, which first arose in South Africa, 
which shows a very similar pattern, long branch, lots of mutations, some of exactly the same mutations in spike, ditto the P1 um, uh, variant that first arose in the city of Manaus in, in the Amazonas state in Brazil. And there have been a few other of these. It's a bit hard to know exactly which ones uh, really have different biological properties, the most important of which are, do they spread faster? Do they cause more severe disease? Do they escape existing immunity to some extent, either from previous infection or vaccines? Um, Eric Topol um, quote, uh, coined the, the phrase scariants that of course, as everyone started doing more sequencing, you find more mutations and you can immediately jump to the conclusion that everything is going to, you know, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, there are probably more of these, more than just these three most famous ones that are worth watching. But as I said, it's a bit hard to get the data to differentiate. Um, this has led to some somewhat crazy things. We sequence, as I mentioned, a lot in the UK, and the government really wants to squash out every one of these other imported variants. And uh, as the mail covered it, they had this so-called farcical search for uh, an imported case of P1 where we sequenced a positive test, but they didn't have any linking information to the individual because they hadn't filled out the the card when they went to register for their test. And so there was this amazing detective work done by Public Health England to track this person down and confirm that they were isolated and hadn't done any onward transmission. And there is a huge literature of both lab experiments and real world vaccine data looking at these variants, because this is the sort of question for humanity. Will the vaccines, which are being rolled out, at least in some high income countries right now, and hopefully we'll get to more places in the world as soon as possible, will they stop these variants? And uh, it's almost impossible to keep up with this literature. Here's my kind of current best summary of lab experiments and real world vaccine data. For B117, there's pretty consistent evidence. There's barely any less immune response and the vaccine seemed to work well in the real world. For B1351, there's a lot less immune response, very consistently measuring it in different ways and pretty consistent, although it's, the data are not brilliant, evidence that the vaccines do not work as well for at least transmission and especially asymptomatic carriage. So in other words, they can't block infection, but there is not yet a huge amount of data on whether they block severe disease and death, which is the most important thing. So I think we can cross our fingers and hope that uh, the vaccines will have meaningful efficacy, even if they aren't as good for B1351. That's the one that I think most people are looking at for development of new boosters based on the B1351 variant for deployment later in the in the year. So, and, and can I just say that the speed at which science has moved in this pandemic is unbelievable. Like that I'm talking about, you know, watching the variant, the, the virus evolve in a matter of months that vaccine makers have produced viable alternatives that can begin to go into, turn, uh, into um, trials to be used as boosters in, in just another few months. And then finally, P1, there's a lot less information yet. It seems to be somewhere in between it's uh, B1351 and B117. There's a bit less immune response, but there's not much data yet about how well the vaccines work. Probably, again, it will be somewhere in between. Okay, to give a few con concluding thoughts, if you live in a country where B117 hasn't swept a fixation, do try to act fast because it transmits fast. And even though it seems very likely the vaccines will work against it, if you haven't fully vaccinated, it can spread and cause a really dreadful wave. That, and, and it does, there's conflicting, but but increasingly consistent evidence that it's also more lethal. And so it can lead to a lot of deaths. Um, strict lockdown can shrink, it's our number below one. The vaccines do seem to be effective, which is really, really good news. Um, if you are like the UK is in a position where 117 has swept fixation, you wanna watch out for the variants that are less well neutralized by vaccines. B1351 is still like about a quarter of a percent or something of new cases. But I told you that almost all other lineages other than B117 are almost extinct. And B1351 has been imported over the last several, you know, six or eight weeks and seems to be sticking around at a very low level. And that is absolutely the critical warning sign that we have to watch out for as the country lifts its lockdown. And we believe that genomic surveillance will continue to be important around the world. Uh, there's a little web app we put out last week at covid19.sanger.ac.uk that you can play with some of the graphs that I showed you uh, over time and location by location. We'll keep adding stuff to that. It's fed by real-time data that now has a one-week turnaround from swab up the nose to being on this website, which is an amazing achievement of the last thing I'll say, which is to thank the hundreds of people who have come together in what has been the most rewarding and amazing experience of my scientific career to try to use our you know, facilities and talents to the best we can to, to make a contribution to the pandemic.
I'll call out a few people in, in, uh, in names in, in bigger text on the right-hand side who really made a key contribution. Uh, and thanks very much for your attention and happy to have some discussion. Thanks very much, Jeff. That was, was brilliant. Um, whilst we're just waiting for um, folks to ask their questions in the, the chat, um, might just say, I'm not sure whether you're aware or not, but um, your talk is very prescient because um, Brisbane's actually just undergone lockdown in the last couple of days. So we've oh, had yeah. a, a cluster of the B117 um, variant. Um, in fact, at the, the PA hospital where uh, Diamantina is situated, um, coincidentally. So this is our second day of lockdown, I think, and um, the government's just kind of um, waiting to, to see whether they can get on top of things. Um, I did not so, know that, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just in time for Easter, unfortunately. Yeah, that's um, good. So, 